If you head to the Forge World store and check under the Necromunda section, you'll find some of the most amazing miniatures that Games Workshop has ever made. Getting those models onto the table, however, is kind of tricky. In this video, I'm going to look at the models outside of the core gang and see how you can get them onto the table. These models are split into a couple of different groups. The first we look at today are the Brutes and Hangers On. In a campaign, you can't start with any, but you can recruit them at the end of a battle. In the Dominion campaign, you could put aside some credits and pick up a Brute or Hanger On at the end of the first battle, but Cinderac Burning changes this by removing any unspent credits, so you have to earn some credits first. The total number of Hangers On and Brutes you have is limited by the amount of reputation you have. You start with one reputation, which allows you to take either one Hanger On or one Brute. Each time your reputation hits a multiple of 5, you get an extra one. So if you're at 20 reputation, you can have at most a combination of 4 Hangers On and Brutes. Be careful though, as you can lose rep, so make sure you leave a buffer, as if you drop a bracket, you have to trim down to new level losing any of those credits. Brutes are your big guys. Apart from the reputation limit, they're the exact same as any other fighter you have. These typically are dangerous and tough to take down if you don't have the right tools. A melted gun will deal with a brute, but if you don't have something to get through their armor and wounds, they can make mincemeat of a gang. This goes both ways though. They are a big investment and you have to save for it. If they get killed or captured, you're going to be out of chunk. In many games, they'll just end up being a bullet magnet as the enemy gang keeps pumping rounds into them to keep them pinned each turn. Along with the faction only brutes, there are two of particular note that anyone can take. The Ambot is generally considered one of the better brute options. Ambles are a tunneling Xenos, and sticking your brains into a robotic version is great for working the mines. And with some minor modifications, murder. It's got infiltrate, so you can quickly get up close to the enemy. Turning off the safe mode increases the number of melee attacks, turning this into something truly fearsome. But keep your friendlies out of melee range. There is an option for a grab fist, but at 70 credits it is quite expensive for what it does. Hilariously, if the Ambot does end up captured and the owning gang doesn't manage to rescue it, then the capturing gang can reprogram the Ambot and add it to their list for free. The Ogren are a similar cost, but you get more options. They start with two Augmetic Fists, but can replace one for an Arc Welder, a Spudjacker, or a Storm Welder. Personally, I think they're much cooler, but they end up being more expensive and often less effective than the Ambot. Both the Ambot and the Ogren have boxes that you can pick up from the GW store. Now, I did say two, but here's a third option. This Iron Automata is a little different. This represents a strange man-like machine sometimes found in the ash waste or deep hive bottoms, heavily hinting at it being a man of iron from the Dark Age of Technology. UR025 from Blackstone Fortress box is perfect for this. It has a fantastic assault cannon, but on occasion will go insane, try to kill your gang members and then disappear into the tunnels, never to be seen again. That leaves you out of credits and probably with a few gangers bleeding to death. A different approach is with exotic beasts. These are pets and critters. I mention them here as the models are often thematically similar to the brutes, just smaller. They're actually considered to be equipment and follow normal equipment rules. So you can get a cyber mastiff, but it is assigned to a gang member and the exotic beast model appears on the board while that gang member is on board. They'll always stay within three inches of their owner and are activated at the same time as the owner with group activation. They do actually gain experience and injuries though. The alternative to brutes are the hangers on. While you want to get your brutes into battles, you're getting your hangers on for their abilities. At last count, there were about 10 generic hangers on that anyone could take and another two or three specific to each gang. While there are models for the various hangers on, they cannot be fielded normally unless they have a special rule. If you're defending your home territory, however, there is a 50-50 chance at the start of a game that the hangers on will have been unlucky and will end up in the fight where they could potentially be captured or killed. The options that GW have models for are the Rogue Doc, who gives you one free medical escort to each battle. They cost 50 credits, so quickly they'll earn their money back. The Gang Lookout gives you a bonus if you have to roll to see who's the attacker or the defender. And during a sneak attack scenario, they give your sentry a bonus to spot the attacker. We mentioned the Rogue Doc. This is Dr. Arachnos. What are 50 credits? He costs 100, but he does have the part of the crew special rule, so you can actually field him in battle. Next up, we have the Scabber and the Slopper. The Scabber is actually an outlaw hanger-on and helps you buy and sell illegal equipment. 
the slopper helps get your fighters out of recovery. Now, it is only a 1 in 6 chance, but for 20 credits, it's probably better than nothing. Bigby Crumb is the special character slopper, and like Dr. Arachnus, he will get stuck in for a fight. The Dome Runner will let you reroll loot caskets, while the Ammo Jack lets you reroll failed ammo tests if you roll a 1. If you have a second Ammo Jack, you can reroll 2s, and at max, if you've got 3 Ammo Jacks, you can reroll failed ammo rolls of 3 or less. Ragnar Gunstein doubles the price, but he will get in the action and also deploys a few ammo caches on the table, which can be very handy. There's the Propagandist and the Agitator. When you win a battle, the Propagandist will make sure people know about it, getting you an additional D3 rep. Unfortunately, when you lose, this will also mean an extra one lost in your rep. He also gives a 1 in 6 chance of getting an extra juve when you hire one. The Agitator is the Outlaw equivalent, applying the same rep changes, but instead of a chance of free juve, he lets you re-roll twice and choose when recruiting free fighters. Next up, we have some of the recently announced hangers on. The first is a Brute Handler, who will turn off the battles and keeps close to your Brute, giving your Brute nerves of steel along with a bunch of mental rerolls. It'll also give you a chance to gain some extra XP on your Brute, which can be very handy. The second is a Chem Dealer, who makes getting chems easier and will front you for a dose at the start of a battle as long as you pay for it by the end. Then we have the Underhive Traders, of which there are three different models. Each have a different type of bonus connected to the trading post. The Relic Monger gives a 6 plus to ignore seriously injured or out of action. The Beast Wrangler gives plus 1 XP to a pet per cycle, while the Gunsmith lets you upgrade a new gun to a Masterwork version for free. These will all look fantastic uh, along with the Marketplace scenery set. That's all the models I could find so far. There are a few other generic hangers on that don't have models, and each of the big houses have two or three themselves. GW have announced this Shiver and Clan Chemist for House Escher, so I think we can expect to see more of these gang-specific hangers on in future. Having models are fun, but I think most of the time they're not going to see play on the table. Honestly, you could just pick up a box of the generic hive scum and use one of those models if your hanger on gets unlucky and has to turn up to a battle. That said, the hangers-on are really beautiful models, and if nothing else, make great scenery. Next up, we have Hired Guns. These have a cost like normal gangers, but they only stick around for one battle. On the plus side, you're not too bothered if they die, but they can end up getting quite expensive. At the cheapest, you can get a hive scum for 30 credits, but that's without any gear, and you have to pay for any gear they get. So, for 40 credits, you can get a hive scum with a reclaimed auto gun pretty much bottom of the barrel. An Escher gang sister with a las gun is a bargain 55 credits. So what's the advantage if you only get a hive scum for one fight? Well, you add them in after you've picked your crew. So if the scenario says random five, you randomly select five of your gangers, then you add in the hired guns as well. You can have up to five hive scum, which even with reclaimed auto guns could be a big advantage. There is a hive scum sprue, which will make four scummers, it's got a pretty good selection of options, especially heads, so each model will look distinct. The range of weapons is also pretty good, but it doesn't have any duplicates. So if you're looking to field four with auto guns, you're going to have to buy four packs of this, or you know, find some other way of subbing in auto guns. In addition to generic scum that you can tailor to your needs, there are also some character scum that you can recruit as part of the five. Here we have the siblings Gain and Vunder Gorvus. This will count as part of your five hive scum, both of them combined coming to just under 300. The next level up is a Bounty Hunter, of which you can have only one. These cost 80 credits and have better stats, with three different profiles, so you can fine-tune your Bounty Hunter as required. You can gear them up with up to 150 credits from your leader's gear list, and they will get either three random skills, or one selected skill and one random skill. Like the Hive Scum, they don't get added to your gang, and are added to your crew after crew selection. They do have two rules that can get you some of those credits back. If you manage to kill an enemy fighter, you may use the Bounty Hunter's Dead Not Alive special rule to claim a reward from the authorities and split it with the gang, which gets half the cost of the dead fighter. If the gang manages to capture an enemy fighter, on a 3 plus roll, the Bounty Hunter recognizes the captive as a wanted individual and splits the reward, with the gang getting a total of D6 by 10 credits. If at the end of the battle, neither of these abilities are used, then the Bounty Hunter will stick around for one more and only one more fight. If one ability used, then it's a 50-50 chance. As the abilities are a may, not a must, you could take a Bounty Hunter and guarantee you'll have them for the next two games. That could be great value for those last two games of the campaign. There aren't any specific models for generic Bounty Hunters. Here I've used the pictures of two named Bounty Hunters, 
Grendel Grendelson and Belladonna, both of who have their own stats and special abilities. This is the perfect opportunity to custom build your own bounty hunter, and if you're in a campaign you should be able to reliably have them turn up for those last two games. Just like with Hive Scum, there are named bounty hunters with their own cards. Here we have the infamous Cal Jericho along with his trusty sidekick Scabs, who is actually a Hive Scum. If you hire Cal though, you have the option to hire Scabs for half price, and then Scabs counts as a bounty hunter rather than as a Hive Scum, with the pair counting as your one bounty hunter choice. There are a ton of character bounty hunters, and they make up the majority of the models available on Forge World. The Book of Peril does have rules for a Venator gang, which is a group of bounty hunters that have teamed up, but you don't get to use the special characters. Obviously you can use the models without the special rules, and that's the case for any gang, as long as your opponent knows what's going on. Next up again are the house agents. You can't choose to hire a house agent. Instead, you give up your chance to roll on house favours to get a roll to request an agent instead. The house favours table appears in the arbitrary tool section of the rulebook, so it is considered an optional rule. When rolling on the favours table, you get bonuses if other players are ahead of you in the campaign, so it's a bit of a catch-up mechanic. Although not specifically stated, presumably house agents are also an optional rule, as you have to choose between them or house favours. The roll is d6 plus rep, and you want to roll low. 1 to 5 means you get the agent for 40 credits, 6 to 10 means it costs 80, and 11 or more means your petition is denied. These are similar in many ways to bounty hunters, but they lose the bounty rules and instead get the gang hierarchy and group activation rules. Crucially, they bring their own 150 credits worth of equipment with them, so you are actually getting a good bargain. Along with the generic version, there are a few pre-statted and pre-equipped fighters. Some of these adjust the cost to 100 and 200, but you're presumably getting a lot more bang for your buck. Another optional rule is to include alliances. These are various factions within the game that can lend aid and support to your gang. These also take up your house favours role, so presumably you can't have a house agent and an alliance. One of the perks of these alliances is they provide additional fighters who come from the alliance faction. They are very flavourful, but as you aren't paying credits for them, they are also extremely powerful. Of course, nothing is truly free, and rather than paying credits, you end up trading favours instead. As an example, House Grame are the most military of the noble houses in Necromunda. If you're in an alliance with them, they'll make sure your fighters get the best ammunition, which will allow them to re-roll ammo checks. They will also provide a military attaché, which includes a Kriegmaster with a bolt gun, power sword and light carbus, along with a Jaegerkin bodyguard who has a combat shotgun and mesh armor. It's not all good though. At the start of each battle before crews are selected, a random fighter is selected. They were seconded to the militia and have to roll on the entry table. This happens again if you lose a battle. In addition, during the post-battle sequence, all your Jews have to roll, and on a 1, they get drafted and you never get to see them again. Getting support from a fallen house will get you a rebel lord of your own design, or Lady Credo, who features heavily in the new Cinderac Burning campaign. As part of the rebellion, you will get bonus credits for defeating law-abiding gangs, Enforcer gangs or any gang allied with the guilds or noble houses. You will, however, need to fulfill your oaths to the Fallen House, providing a tithe of D3 by 10 credits after each battle. Rather than worrying about noble houses, you could look for support from one of the guilds. Here we have the Water Guild. Access to clean water gives you an effective slopper, or boost one you already have to a 5 plus. The Water Guild also comes with this fantastic looking delegation, which includes the brute like Subnauticant bodyguard which is very similar to an Ambot. In classic creepy Necromunda style, these will increase the chances of capturing an enemy fighter, but they will get sold to the Water Guild immediately, presumably draining them of all their fluids. As a drawback, the Water Guild will reduce winnings each battle by D3 by 10, so taking their cut. Similar to the Water Guild, we have the Slave Guild. They bring weapon training, letting you add a primary skill to one of your champions or your leader for the duration of the battle, the Slaver's Entourage is full of melee goodness and can be quite deadly. For their drawback, they claim all captured fighters for themselves, which shouldn't bother you too much, beyond maybe some moral qualms. They also have a special rule where if one of your gangers or juves took someone out in melee or performed a coup de grace, you roll a d6, and on a 6, the Slave Lord is impressed and rewards the gang with d3 by 10 credits. But on a 1, the Slave Lord is very impressed and takes the fighter for a career in the fighting bits, essentially deleting them from the gang. 
those are the only alliances with models right now. But there are plenty of other alliances that you could put together some custom models for. While the standard way to use these models is to have a gang allied with them, Book of the Outcast also has an option to start a gang using a delegation. So, for example, you could start with a Creek Master as your leader, a Jaegerkin as a ganger. You don't get to take additional models from the delegation, but you can use it as a core for your Outcast gang. Okay, those are the different ways you can get models on a table. Brutes and exotic beasts are relatively simple, and you'll get to use them as much as you like. The hangers on are a little hit and miss. Really, you're taking them for the ability, and as they cost credits and compete with brutes, they need to be worth it. Typically, players seem to take hangers on that will have a good return on investment, essentially spending credits to make more credits long term. The rogue dock is a perfect example of this. Unfortunately, as fantastic as the models are, in many campaigns you'll never get to use them, which is a real shame. On the other hand, we have hired guns, who only stick around for one battle. The real question here is how much a fighter is worth for a single battle. And through the years, GW have struggled with this question, resulting in multiple different approaches. Most hired guns are overcosted for what they do, but being able to take them as a bonus to starting crew is a massive boost. Unfortunately, this means that rather than a catch-up mechanic for an under strength gang, they end up as extra insurance for a powerful gang overflowing with credits. Hive scum are extra bodies, which really is what counts the most. Bounty hunters have a weird quirk where they will stick around for two battles, which helps improve their value. Then we have the house agents, who will work for cheap for low reputation gangs. But maybe those gangs should be spending credits on a ganger instead. All variations on the same theme. Alliances bring it to the natural extreme, as you are essentially getting fighters for free. There are drawbacks, but the advantages are so great that it's unlikely you'll really worry about them. I suspect the majority of campaigns will not allow alliances. They really feel like a step too far. Also following the free approach, the Cinderac Burning campaign that recently came out gives the players the option of supporting the Imperial House, Lady Credo's Rebellion, or staying unlined. At the start of each battle, there's a 4 plus chance that you'll be able to use one of the special characters aligned to that faction for free. It's a great way to get story into the game, but it definitely feels bad when your opponent rolls high and you don't. As with all things Necromunda, the rule of cool is the one rule that matters. If you're putting together a one-off game, some of these models are perfect for a really fun encounter. These can also be used as a blunt force catch-up mechanic. If an arbitrator wants to keep things more interesting, they can assign an alliance or a bounty hunter for free to a gang that's taken a bit of a mauling in the first half of the campaign. This should give them a nice boost to catch up and keep the games interesting. The rules as written often are problematic, and rare is a campaign where there aren't some sort of house rules to patch over the gaps. One option that appeared in White Dwarf May 2019 was to use the difference in credits between starting crews, and rather than just getting extra tactics cards for 100 points, as usual, the underdog gang has the option to instead spend that on hired guns. This is definitely a house rule I like, not only because it's a great excuse to pick up some of these fantastic models, but also because it's similar to Blood Bowl's inducements, which have been a great balancing tool. It's a little unfortunate that the rules as written don't really encourage playing these miniatures. For brutes, typically one ambot is plenty. Hangers on don't want to be on the battlefield, and varieties of hired guns are usually credits better spent gearing up your gang. Luckily, Necromunda is more of a mood than a strict game, and the rules are at best guidelines. So take some time to look through the range and pick out something that speaks to you. I'm not sure how, but if you paint it up, it will see play. And you'll have a story of how that model became a legend of the Underhive, or got blown away on their first appearance. Thanks for making it all the way to the end. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Each week I put up a new video talking about one of Games Workshop's specialist games. The goal is always to try and make the best possible two-player experience. If this is something you'd find interesting, please subscribe to the channel and comment to let me know what you'd like to see in future.